to Shiloh. Is everybody doing tonight? Who's had a blessed day today? Let's stand and sing tonight and then welcome in the Holy Ghost and just sing about his glorious and powerful self that he is. He is still the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. precious blood of the Lamb. I got so tickled standing over there just getting an image in my mind of Brother Calvin Parker because I promised you if he'd been in this building tonight and you'd have started singing that song, he'd have hit the aisle dancing. Amen. Amen. Because he knew there was power in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. What is that power all about? It is about the hand of God in our lives. Amen. To uh, so wonderfully wonderfully ministered to us in every stage of life. I will never forget one of the last conversations I ever had with Brother Calvin. I went to his house to visit him, and before I got ready to leave that day, he said to me, he said, Pastor, I just, have you got a few more minutes? And I said, yes, sir. He said, I need to talk to you. I said, all right, what is it? He said, I want you to pray with me. That tomorrow, if I'm not in my right mind and no longer have the ability to tell my God that I love him, 
I want you to pray with me that he will know that I love him. I've never forgot that conversation. And I thought to myself, God, I would that I would have such a desire to love you that I not only want to love you today, but I want to go ahead and set a standard that you know if I'm not physically able to love you tomorrow that you already know I love you. My Lord, how mercy. Folks, that is the presence and the power of God in an individual's life. Amen. To, uh, to say and to do and to be. Amen. I was reading in our preparation for um, uh, messages that are coming up today, some of uh, Eugene Peterson's writings and such a powerful writer and I just picked up a little something that he said and I'd heard it and read it before but it just really spoke to me so powerfully today it said prayers are tools not for doing or getting but for being and becoming I just want to say that to you again prayers are tools not for doing or getting but for being and becoming and I just felt the Spirit of the Lord whisper in my heart and say, I'm not nearly as concerned about what you're doing as I am what you're becoming. And I just want to become what He would have me to become. Don't you? Amen. Good to have you all here tonight. Glad to have those joining us on iChurch. We appreciate you being here. And uh, I I've already felt the presence of the Lord here in the house tonight. Amen. And I know it's a struggle sometimes during the week to get here and uh, you know, the, the week just, you know, the world calls this the hump day. I don't call it hump day. I just call it another day that the Lord has made. Amen. We can hump on it if you want to. It doesn't matter to me. It's just, I mean, it's hump day. They say it's hump day, but I just say let's jump on it with both hands and feet and worship God in spirit and in truth here in this house tonight. Amen. Because I believe God wants us to serve Him with every fiber of our being. Amen. It doesn't matter whether it's hump day or Thursday or Friday or sad day. It's the day that the Lord hath made. Let's worship Him tonight. Amen. Let Him know tonight how much we love Him, how much we appreciate Him, and how much we're thankful for Him. And I'm glad tonight that you've entered into this house, regardless of what you had to fight through to get here, to be here and position your place, self in a place where God could bless you. Amen? Amen? Aren't you? Let's do that right now as we invite him. Those that are joining us through our church, join us right here now. Heavenly Father, we welcome you into this place. Father, we say thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for your mercies, for the favor of God and the celebration, God, of who you are in our lives. God, I'm just so thankful, Lord, tonight that you have made it possible for us to come together and worship you in spirit and in truth. We've come to celebrate who you are. We've come to applaud the fact that our God is still in control. We've come tonight to position ourselves in a place in the presence of Almighty God where we can taste and see the goodness of God and the mercies of the world. We're thankful tonight, God, because of that that you have created in this life that we now live, our one and only life, that we have the opportunity to share in the love of Jesus Christ and experience you, God, in this day. In this day. For this is the day that the Lord hath made and we are to rejoice and be glad in it. I know, no doubt, many come in this building tonight tired and uh, feeling the effects of a day at work and a week that is now half over. But we come tonight to position ourselves right in the presence of God and to celebrate who you are and whose we are in you. God, I'm so thankful for your goodness, for your mercy and the love of God tonight that's flowing in this building. And God, I'm thankful because this is the one thing that the world cannot duplicate. And that is the presence of Almighty God. The love that we can experience when we come together in fellowship. What takes place right here in this building. As hard as we try to mimic it online, we are not physically able to do that. Because there's something special about walking in these doors and celebrating with those that are around you. 
As hard as this ministry team is working to mimic that online, God, I pray that we're able to do our very best, but yet that I'm afraid we'll never be able to fully, fully mimic, Lord. Thank you for your presence in this house. But I am as well thankful for those that are joining us on our church that your presence are in their house as well. As they've set aside this time tonight to establish a fellowship with the Master. Let it be done, God, right now according to your will in Jesus' precious holy name we pray. And the church said amen and amen. Turn to your neighbor before you're seated. Amen. Go ahead and love them from a distance. Amen. Let them know you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord. And you may be seated there tonight. Amen. I was uh, asked to announce those of you that have uh, young folks next door, uh, if you will, when service is over, instead of them coming here, uh, they ask that you go over there. I think they have some information they need to get to you tonight. Uh, so we encourage you to uh, do that when service is over. I'll try to remind you, Kelly, you make sure I do remind them, all right? But uh, please do that when service is over. Go ahead over that way. I think they need to see you there a few minutes. Let's worship the Lord tonight as Nathan carries us in to the presence of the Lord. Amen.
the Lord. Amen. Good to see you all here tonight. We appreciate you being here. Amen. Appreciate you having your young folks uh, here as well. Amen. That is so important and we appreciate that. And I know that's a sacrifice for, for a lot of you to get home from work and get them ready and get them here. But we do appreciate that. Amen. Giving us an opportunity to uh, minister to them, love on them, and allowing them to be a part of what is going on. Amen. I believe it's one of the greatest gifts that you will ever be able to give your child. Amen. Never will be a swing set. Never will there be a bicycle or a four-wheeler or a basketball goal or a Barbie doll that will take the place of what you are putting in their heart when you allow them to learn of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want to talk to you tonight about serve the Lord in a life of holiness. Now, I don't want to lose any of you. People get really nervous when the pastor gets up and says we're going to begin to talk about holiness tonight. And I know that's true in a Pentecostal setting, amen? I'm just going to go ahead and tell you to take a deep breath and relax. It's not what you think, amen? Um, I will say this. There are a lot of things that have been um, the persuasion of minds down through the years that were not necessarily biblical. Um, been a lot of things that have been preached and have been taught by many of us um, that were handed down traditions. Um, the Bible has a lot to say about holiness. Amen. Bible also has a lot to say about a lot of things. I've been doing some reading in Leviticus. If you just want to get your mind stretched a little bit, go and pick up Leviticus and read it a while. I mean, when you begin to understand that, you know, under the law, they even explain to you how if you had a sore come on your skin, uh, the the process of even becoming clean where you were able to associate with those around you. Amen. And even if you had a, a piece of fiber in your home and it, 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 got, it got something on it, there was a it detailed process and it included the shedding of blood and it included you sleeping in the yard a while. Amen. So when I say holiness, I don't want any of you to get scared and say, oh, Lord, he's going to break out the scissors and the measuring tape tonight. Um, no, I want to talk to you about the five characteristics of a holy life. Amen. And it doesn't have to do with an outward appearance nearly as much as it has to do with an inward appearance. Because, you see, I'm a firm believer if we'll get the inside right, the outside will follow suit. Amen. I'm just going to say that again. If we'll get the inside right, the outside will follow suit. Now, what has happened in days gone by, we tried to, put, we tried to set the outside right <laughs> while we had a mess going on on the inside. And what it did was it created a bigger mess than what we had to start with. Amen. There are five characteristics of a holy life. And someone might ask tonight... Um, Darren, I don't believe you got it there, so go ahead and throw up 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. I'll just go ahead and apologize to start with because I hadn't even given you that verse of Scripture. Uh, but the Lord just throwed it in my mind, and I'm now really hoping and praying that, it's, uh, um, that it will be um, the right verse. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. 1 Peter, there it is. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for it is written. Be holy because I'm holy. Someone would say, why is it so important to talk about holiness? I think this verse of Scripture pretty much answers the question. For it is written, be holy because I'm holy. In other words, God declares over our life that we're to live a holy and an acceptable life in the sight of God. Why? Because God is holy. Amen? 
But tonight we're going to be talking about five characteristics of a holy life. Do you try to fit Jesus into your schedule? Or do you work your schedule around Jesus? Those are pretty two strong statements and questions tonight. First, do you try to fit Jesus into your schedule? Or do you work your schedule around Jesus? You see, God cannot fit into our plans. We must fit into His, writes Eugene Peterson. We can't use God. God is not a tool or an appliance or a credit card. Holy is the word that sets God apart and above our attempts to enlist Him in our wishes, in our fulfillment, in our fantasies, or in our schemes for making our mark in this world. Holy means that God is alive on God's terms. Alive in a way that exceeds our experience and our imagination. Holy refers to a life burning with an intense purity that transforms everything it touches into itself. I lost you. I want you to hear this. Holy means that God is alive on God's terms. Alive in a way that exceeds our experiences and our imagination. Holy refers to a life burning with an intense purity that transforms everything it touches into itself. Serving a holy God Fitting ourself into God. John the Baptist declared it like this. I must decrease that he may increase. And in actuality, that's what we're saying when we're inviting a holy and a perfect God into our life. No, it don't work like that. We've got to move into God's life. Amen. The Bible declares over mine and your relationship, and I struggled in this area for a number of years when I was a young Christian. I thought God was going to fit into my life somehow. And the problem I had was my life was not a place where God was going to fit into. And all of a sudden I come to, maybe that's the wrong word, it wasn't all of a sudden, it was over a process of time and the Holy Spirit uh, bringing conviction on me and I began to realize that if I was going to be able to serve God, I was going to have to die and let Christ live in me. Because the problem was I was trying to live out my life, I was trying to serve God, I was trying to do it in the way that I knew how to do it and my ways were the wrong ways. Now God's word describes this for us when he says his ways are higher than my ways. My ways won't work with God. God's ways has to start working through me. And a holy life, holiness simply means that you decrease and the God of heaven increases in your life. And when there gets to be more God in you than there is more world in you, there'll be a transformation in your life. And what's going to happen in your life, God's going to override everything in your life. God will become more important to you than anything else that is going on in the world around you. And it is the only indicator for you to determine where you are fully, fully serving God or not. Because as long as there's still a strong will in you to make decisions on your own and to try to prevail out of your own atmosphere, I want to tell you, you've not turned it over to God. You're still trying to serve God. Amen? God is never going to fit into your life. And the reason why so many Christians, and especially young Christians, struggle in this area is because we don't fully get it. Amen? Nobody's never really taken the time to explain it to us. I remember when I was a young Christian, you know, they just said, okay, you're saved, now live right. All right, what's that mean? Just read your Bible and you'll figure it out. 
And I'm thinking to myself, no, I won't. I'm more confused now than I was last weekend. Somebody help me on this journey. I'm, I'm struggling here. And you know what people told me, Keith? People said to me, they say, you just need to pray more. And I thought to myself, God, I'm praying all I know how to pray, but I'm so confused I don't even feel like there's a God listening to me. Anybody in this building know what I'm talking about tonight? Church, I want to tell you, when you're trying to fit God into your plans, it will not work. Amen. It's like taking a round ball and trying to put it in a square hole. It will not fit. Amen. Because God's ways exceeds our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Amen. When I begin to let God's thoughts reign in my life, amen, then all of a sudden my life begins to transform and change into a way where God can use me for the glory of God. Amen. There's a struggle that goes along with the, with the sound plan of salvation that hinders us many times from being able to accomplish the will of God in our lives. What should our attitude be towards other Christians, other ministries, and other churches? Division among followers of Jesus started very early on. The disciples started arguing about who was the greatest. If you will, go with me to... Um, to Mark chapter 9, verses 33 and 34, and let's begin there. Why? Why do we need to begin here? Because God said it is written, I am holy, therefore you ought to be holy. Amen? They came to Capernaum where he was in the back. He asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? Ain't that just like Christian folks? They're coming to where Jesus, I ain't even going to look at you, brother. Because uh, I know where you're at. I know right where you're at because I've walked right where you're walking, so I'm not even going to look at you, okay? I'm going to come on over here and look at one of these over here that's done been down that road. You ever wondered why? The hardest day of the week to get ready is Sunday. Because God has a plan for your life. We've talked about that plan. That we are to worship God. Amen? And when we're trying, you hear there? We're trying to get to a place and a position where God can manifest Himself in our life and the enemy don't want us to get there. Okay? He'll let you get to work without any problem. He'll let you go hunting without any problem. He'll let you go fishing without any problem. He'll let you go to the mall without any problem. He'll let you do anything else you want to do. You know why? Because that's just stuff we do. But when you decide, as for me and my house, we're going to serve God, we're going to get up on Sunday morning, we're going to go to the house of the Lord and worship Him, you get up and go to work every other day out of the week, and most time you're up by daybreak and out of the house and gone. What in the world? We can't even get here by 1030 on Sunday morning. I'm not casting stone. I'm just telling you that there's a real devil out there that fights us. Amen? And I'm telling you something, you and your wife, you and your bride, you and your children are get along just absolutely beautiful every day except the day that you're trying to get to the house of the Lord. And you'll find every fault there is in your companion on that day and decide that's the day you want to discuss them. Amen? I, I go back to my childhood. This ain't a new thing. This ain't something that just happened. I mean, I remember riding to church. And, and my daddy always had old big battleship cars, and, 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 you know, there was plenty of room in there to spread out, and we'd be spread out because we didn't even like one another. I'm preaching good now. And they'd be madder than wet setting hens going to church, argue all the way there. Amen? But there was something magical about that church property. Because we could pull up on the church property and I'm telling you if they want a transformation my daddy's door could pop open and he would be foaming. And he'd meet somebody in the parking lot and he'd jump out. Hey brother Strickland it's good to see you this morning. I'm thinking to myself who is this man? I know this ain't the same man that's just been talking to us sitting in the back seat of this car. 
But I realized as I got into a relationship with God that there was an adversary that was seeking to devour me. And he was fighting me on my journey of life. But there comes a place where we just have to say, God, I'm turning it over to you. This is not my battle. This is not my fight. And church, I'm telling you, that right there is one of those things that preaches really good, but it's a little harder to live. Now, here's these guys coming to the presence of Jesus. They came where he was and went where he was in the house, and the first thing the Lord said to them, he asked them a question. What were y'all arguing about out there on that road? Now, wouldn't it be something this coming Sunday morning if God showed up out there on the hood of our car when we got here <laughs> and would want to have a conversation about what we've been talking about on the way to church? See, guys, God gave us his word for a reason. And the reason was that there was implications that were going to come out of that word that would transform our life if we'll learn the word and implement the word into our life. You know what God said about the Word? God said in the beginning was God and the Word was with Him. Amen. And then when He sent His Son, He said His Word took on flesh and manifested Himself in the presence of men. This Word is what it's going to take to transform us from where we are to where God wants us to be. So the Lord asked Him a question. He said, what were y'all discussing out there on that road? Uh, and, he, and, he, and he, you know, I said, I said that because that's what we Christians do. We don't argue. We don't have knock-down drag-outs, you know. We don't fight and fuss. We have discussions. But the Lord called it what it was. What were y'all arguing about out there? But they kept quiet. Can, can you imagine? I mean, how many of you just want to say, well, Lord, I, I'm arguing with her because she ain't got no sense. You know, <laughs> I mean, how you going to look at the Lord and say that about your husband? He's supposed to be the head of the house. I mean, you know what you're saying? God, I don't like you. You know. But they kept quiet, verse 34, because on the way they had argued. <laughs> about who was the greatest. They was having a discussion about who's the greatest. It ain't changed all that much, folks. Amen. I mean, you're headed to church and she looks at you and says, you ain't got a lick of sense. You You can't even drive. We're coming to the place to, for transformation, but we're arguing on the way here. And, and, and the Bible said they didn't even want to say nothing to the master. <laughs> We've been arguing, but we don't rather, really rather not say what we was arguing about. Then verse 35 said, sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and he said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. Now it wasn't just to happen so that Jesus said that. Because they didn't tell him what was going on, but the holy God that was in him already knew. Amen. So I just want to go ahead and let you know this coming Sunday morning when you get here, the Lord already knows what's been going on in the car. Amen. But he still got a word for you, and he still had a word for them. Ain't God good? Amen. Because most of us, we'd be so mad and puffed up and so upset and angry because, you know, our youngins was acting that way that we wouldn't even want to bless them, but that ain't God. Amen. God loves us in spite of us. Amen. And he still got a word for us, and he still had a word for them. They were, they were arguing and acting pure crazy and just being pure foolish, but yet God had a word. He just sat down. And, and, and Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last. And then he says something so powerful. Listen to what he said. And the servant of all. 
Now, who did Jesus say that he was? The servant of all. Amen? He not only said it, he amplified it through his actions when he washed the disciples' feet. He not only gave them the word, he showed them the word, and he taught them the word. In other words, what he was saying, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, if you want to be successful, then you got to let me live in you. The Spirit of Christ must dominate you. Amen. Then verse 36 said, He took a little child took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Amen. Giving an illustration, setting a prop up in front of them through a parable that they would be able to understand and hear what the Spirit was saying to the church. First off, what he was really doing was he was laying out five characteristics of a holy life. Amen. And it's interesting to me here because he didn't have anything to say about what we would normally classify holiness to be. Amen. It's funny how we take the outward approach, but God always moves to the inward approach. And he even clarifies that in his word when he said, when men look upon you, they look upon the outward appearance. But not God, for when God looks at you, He looks upon the heart. Amen? Church, what I'm trying to tell you tonight is a holy lifestyle is not a really as much about what we think it's about as it is the fact of we must decrease so that God can increase in us. There's got to be more God in me than there is the world in me. There's got to be more God in me than there is Eddie in me. Amen? And, and that's the easy thing to get up here and say, but it is reality of where the rubber meets the road in a Christian walk, and that is to say, God, I must decrease that you can increase in me. Amen. It is a, a, it is a prop of growing and allowing God to speak to our lives. The first thing he said was, you must be humble. Jesus tells them not to compete uh, to be number one. It is always a temptation to compare. Amen. Now, now, if you don't think I'm right, you let the devil come and start leading you down a road and the first thing he'll say to you is, well, everybody else is doing it. What's anything wrong with you doing it? Amen? God said there's got to be more of me in you. In other words, you have to become humble. Through humility, you will find your place in allowing God to position himself in you where you can grow. Envy and rivalry are great dangers. Jesus said if you're going to compete, it should be to get the last place. That's just totally backwards from everything we've ever been taught. Amen. We want to move forward. We want to be brought up to the front. Amen. I won't never forget. I will never forget. When I first started evangelizing, my spiritual father said to me, he said, Son, when you go into the house of the Lord, he said, Don't you never walk up on that platform till you're invited. And I kind of thought about that, Brother Terry Paul, and I thought to myself, But that's where I'm supposed to be. And then he's giving me a verse of Scripture. He said, Those that are first shall be last, and those that are last shall be first. Amen. And, and I remember that, Keith. And when I would walk into a church, I didn't never go to that. Many times they'd come get me and carry me up there. Sometimes they'd leave me sitting there till it was my time to go, and they would call me up there. But he said, you do never elevate yourself. Amen. You allow God to elevate you. You allow God to position you. Amen. What Jesus was saying here, just be humble. Don't try to be first. Amen. Just try to be like Jesus. Amen. Try to be the servant of all, amen. And then secondly, he said you got to do it through love, amen. Of course, Mark 9, 36 and 37 tells about it, all about it. It says love and welcome everyone, even those who are unable to do anything for you. The very young, the weak, the poor, 
In doing so, you're loving and welcoming Jesus. Now, I just want you to think about this for a moment. He first told them to be humble, and then he said, just love them. And then he, he took a little child up in his lap. Now, we got to think about this. That little child, we look at it many times from the perspective of that childlike faith, and I believe that's part of what God was talking about. But what I believe Jesus really wanted them to see right then, here's a child. This child can't do anything for you. You only do for that child. Amen? And he said, many times we want to put ourselves in a place. Hmm. Help me, God. We want to put ourselves in a place that brings attention to us in a place of favor we preachers are the world's worst for this you're getting a bunch of preachers and the first thing they want to know is how many did you have Sunday we judge everything off of how many we had Sunday I've learned something how many did you have Sunday? I told one man this not too long ago. He asked me. He said, how many did y'all have Sunday? I said, two. I could see the look on his face. I said, well, me and my wife, we rode together. I said, it just won't be two of us. I said, now, we had some other folks join us there, but God brought them. Guys, I want, I want to tell you something. We have, a, we have an aptitude in our life, amen where we feel like that, that we, need to, we need to position ourselves in a place. We put ourselves in a place. You see what these guys were doing? They say, Lord, who's going to get to sit beside of you? Amen. And you know what the Lord said? He said, guys, y'all got to get humble. Can you bear this cup that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drink? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what he said, yeah. Amen. He said, love. Love and welcome everyone with those that you're unable to do anything for you. The very young, the weak, the poor. In doing so, you are loving and welcoming Jesus. Not only did he teach them to uh, be humble and he teach them to love, but he taught them tolerance. Jesus tells the disciples not to dismiss or judge others who do things in Jesus' name. Just because they are not part of your group or do things in a different manner of how you do them. It is a mistake to dismiss other Christians, other denominations, or other organizations because they're not one of us. Look at Mark chapter uh, 38 and 39. Teacher, said, John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Verse 39 said, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, do not stop him. No, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. Amen. Look at verse 41. He said, truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. You see, it's easy to look at others and think, well, God can't be in that. What if God is in that? Amen. So Jesus taught them, you want to know what it looks like to be holy? You've got to be humble. You've got to be a, a passionate lover, amen, of those that are around you. Whether they can help you, whether they can bless you, you are called to love people. And then you're to be tolerant, amen. Just because somebody looks different than you look don't mean they're not of God. Amen. It's been a few years ago. They had opened up a facility over there. I don't know why they closed it, but it was outside of Salemburg. It was a music park. They had opened up a campground there, and, and I don't even remember what they called it, but they had bluegrass festivals there. And my brother-in-law done the wiring there, and so he got tickets to everything that was coming along. Well, he didn't care nothing about that stuff, and he'd give me tickets, and I'd go to the bluegrass festival. I'd sit over there, and Tammy wouldn't even go with me. 
She went one time. She said, I cannot stand this. Yank, 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 yank. I'd go over there and I'd spread out my long chair and I'd sit right there with my little cooler and I'd smile all day long. Listen to them people sing that bluegrass. I absolutely loved it. Well, they, had a, they brought in a, 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 a gospel group, several different groups, and they invited me to go and preach. I don't even remember who put it together. Well, I went over there, and it, my time was later on in the afternoon because, you know, they had all the good people lined up first, and, and they had me later on in the afternoon. And, and, and I noticed these two young folks down there, young boy and a young girl. And uh, I, I hadn't heard this word in a while, but it kind of looked gothic. I think that's the right word. They were all dressed in black. Their hair was dyed black. I don't think that was natural. It didn't look that natural. Um, and when they come up, I'm standing here holier than thou, you know, looking at these two young folks thinking to myself, they must have thought there was a different deal going on here today. Because they had all kind of music out there, different concerts. And I thought they caught the wrong day. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly what I thought. And they're sitting up there in their lawn chairs in front of me, and the first group that got up and started singing, them two young people jumped up out of their chairs and throwed up their hands and went to glorifying and magnifying God and worshiping the Lord. And I'm sitting there getting lower and lower in my chair, thinking to myself, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. I watched these two people, a young man and a young lady, worship God all day long. <laughs> and I watched them praise God. And I watched them uh, just lifting up the name of the Lord. They'd stand a while and dance. And I'd think to myself, I wish y'all would sit down. And, you know, they, they look different than me. But what I realized was that God had put a pure heart in them to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, there was a few folks that was there to hear me preach, maybe one or two. And when it got time for me to preach, I'd never seen two people worship God like them two people worship God. I watched them as they had an encounter with the Holy Spirit and God's Spirit moved on them. They spoke in other tongues and I said, Father, you're in this place. What I'm trying to tell you is I looked on the outward but God had done a work on the inside that had manifested itself on the outside yet. And now before we get too bit out of shape I just want to tell you God's still working on some folks in this room and you don't quite look like you're going to look yet. Amen. Amen. Matter of fact, we're not even calling you by the right name yet. Amen. I'm talking about holiness now. He said that we're to be humble and that we're to have a heart of love and we're to be tolerant from those that are different from us. And then he said, you're also to be disciplined. Y'all thought I was going to forget that one, didn't you? Amen. He said, you're to be disciplined. Look at Mark chapter 9, verse 42. I just want you to hear what the Word says. Mark 9 and 42. Maybe I didn't have that one either. It said, If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone was hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. I'm talking about being disciplined. Now, when I throwed that word out there, some of you got happy because you thought, oh, boy, now he's fixing to get them. Remember what God said? God said, man looks on the outward appearance. But I move over here and look on the heart. Amen? Now, I believe there's a standard of holiness that's going to manifest itself in the flesh. I believe that. But church, for way too long, we tried to get the flesh right and forgot about the inside. And God is speaking to the church and saying, it's time to get the inside right, and I'll manifest myself in an outward appearance. Amen? Hmm. I got a good friend. My Lord, how much I love to see that boy. Because every time I see that boy, he grabs me and he puts one of them bear hug gloves on me. 
I won't never forget when God saved him. He had hair down to his back, down to his belt. Beard that you about matched it. And now I'm, I'm talking about during an era of time when we didn't know people could be saved and look like that. Some of you may still have doubts, but I'm going to just tell you, talk to the master about that. And I won't never forget what he told me. He said, I struggled so long because of who I was, but who I felt like I needed to be. Because he attended a Pentecostal church. And he said, I look so out of place. He said, so I did that that was contrary to who I was, and I conformed, are you hearing me, to those that were around me, but that weren't who I was. How many people have we run out of the church because we tried to transform them to look like us? to act like us, to talk like us, to be like us. You know what God said? God said you need to discipline yourself because we sometimes tolerate sin in our own lives but are intolerant towards other people's sin. Jesus teaches us to be tolerant towards others but intolerant about sin in our own lives. Be disciplined, uncompromising, and radical about sin in your own life. Now just so you know that I'm still preaching the word of God, God said be sure and tend to that little moat that is in your eye before you worry about trying to get that beam. See, we've got standards that have been set up and established around us, amen? God said, if any one of us calls one of these little ones, those that believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone was hung around their neck and they were thrown into a sea. That'd be a mess, amen? You're probably going to drown there. And I think that's what God's trying to tell us. Amen? And then we've got to be last. We've got to be filled with peace. Mark 9 and 50, Jesus tells them not to argue but to be at peace. Jesus longed for his disciples to get along with one another, to stop arguing, and to be at peace with each other. Later, he prayed that they be one in order that the world would believe, according to John 17 and 21. Lord, Help me through the power of your Holy Spirit to live a holy life and to develop the characteristics of humility, love, tolerance, discipline, peace, and faithfulness. Will you stand to your feet? It's easy to look at the world around us. what he echoed in time the greatest of all words that were ever spoken I believe by the master when he said for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believed in him would be saved I believe there's going to be a manifestation of God's spirit that comes out of one life when God gets in full control of one I open with that statement and I want to close there again holy is the word that sets God apart and above our attempt to enlist him in our wishes in fulfillment and fantasies of our 
schemes for making our mark in the world. Holy means that God is alive on God's terms. Alive in a way that exceeds our experiences and our imagination. And holy refers to the life burning with an intense purity that transformed everything it touches into itself. Somehow out of that, the church thought we were supposed to go out and burn the draft. We're supposed to go out and clean the world up, set the world straight. That is an outward manifestation of something we have no control of. God said holiness starts within. I believe when God moves in and begins to dictate the patterns of our life, our lives will change and become acceptable to the standard in which God counts to be holy. But that has very little to do with what I think. That has to do with one measure and one measure only. And that is what thus saith the Word of God. times have I looked at somebody out of the outward appearance and thought they cannot be saved. Ain't no way they can be serving God. And God says, but you don't see what I see in your heart. You just give me a little while and I'm going to get outside and look at my head. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love and for your word. I thank you, God, that we can serve you in a life of holiness, but it has to begin when God and your spirit filtrates our lives and takes over there that we no longer are in control but the spirit of God is in control of us then we're going to start looking like you look how do you look? you look from the heart amen I believe God's spirit living within us will be a spirit of discernment I've seen many a person that didn't look quite like I thought they ought to look but my spirit bore witness with their spirit And I believe that's what you're saying to us, God. We need to become holy, amen. We need to leave our tape measure at home and just become holy as God is holy from the inside out. Do a work in us, oh God, like you've never done before. Purge my heart, oh God. Create in me. I cry out today as David. Create in me, oh God, a right spirit. You're never going to fit into my life, God. I got to fit into you. That your ways become my ways and your thoughts become my thoughts. We ask it in Jesus' name. I just want to share with you tonight and say to you maybe those that are watching through our church tonight and maybe anyone else in this building, maybe there's been a place in your life where you felt like you weren't good enough or you've been dejected. I just want to tell you that's not the Spirit of God, that's the Spirit of flesh. God loves you tonight just like you are. We may have been taught our whole life, well, I've got to do this for God to love me. That's a lie from Hades. God loves you right where you're at with an unconditional love. He loved you where you were at so much that He gave His only begotten Son. Not when you got cleaned up, but before you got cleaned up. God wants to do a new thing in the church's heart. Amen. I believe God wants to do a new thing in the church's heart. To open our eyes and our ears to the Spirit of the Lord and what true holiness looks like. And that is an acceptable attitude in the sight of God. Oh God, help us, oh Lord. Help us, oh Lord. Lord, help me through the power of the Holy Spirit to live a holy life and to develop the characteristics of humility and love and tolerance and discipline and peace. And allow me to do it in faithfulness unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. If you don't know Him tonight, He wants you to know Him. And I just want to tell you, if you've ever been hurt in church, that won't who God is. That's who man was. And I just want to tell you tonight, there are many people that might have looked at you and been disappointed in you, but I just got to say that I don't believe God is disappointed in you, but God loves you tonight. He loves you so much that He gave His one and only begotten Son that you could come to Him 
on His terms and accept Him as your Lord and Savior. Turn from your wicked way and begin to walk in the path that He would have you to walk. Not trying to live up to a standard that somebody else sets for you, but living up to the standard that thus saith the Word of God. You can grow in this Word. You can be developed in this Word. Walk in it according to His will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I want to remind you to Please go over next door if you've got children over there or grandchildren. I believe they need to see you. Thank you so much for being here.